What's up, everybody? This is Matt Hosper, the prospecting geologist here with our next video, which is a um, going to be on a topic that I think many people have requested and are interested in, especially in the southeastern United States, from Maryland pretty much down to Alabama. Um, and that is the formation of the gold deposits of the southeastern United States. Um, and this part is going to focus on what's called submarine exhalative deposits. And then also we're going to be talking about probably what everybody really wants to know is more or less how to find these and what to look for in these areas to find them. So let's get started. Um, so basically we'll start off with an intro here with everything. Of course, as many of you know, the southeastern United States was home to the first gold rush in, I believe, 1799 at the Reed, what would become the Reed Gold Mine in North Carolina, where uh, I think it was Conrad Reed's son found a 17-pound gold nugget in a uh, in the nearby creek and took it up to his parents and basically they didn't know what it was at the time and it was used as a doorstop for a number of years until i think they for some reason i don't remember the whole story but took it to somebody and they said yeah this is gold and they sold it but they got ripped off big time um i think there was a whole lawsuit went back and forth over that and a whole bunch of interesting history in that first nugget being found in north carolina which then sparked the first gold rush in the U.S. Now, in some of my research, it seems that the first, like, true documented gold discovery actually happened earlier in about 1782, where uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote about a 17... It was, it was a four-pound rock found on the banks of the Rappahannock River... Uh, just downstream of the fall line east of Fredericksburg a little bit that had when crushed it had 17 penny weight of gold and it's almost an ounce and that was documented back in 1782 um but nothing ever came of it so it was documented 1782 but the gold the gold mining in Virginia didn't start until I think almost 1805 so it seems like possibly the first documented case of gold in the southeast was probably in 1782 by thomas jefferson but the first case of gold being found and sparking a gold rush was in 1799 at the reed gold mine in north carolina um and the, the history throughout this entire region is i if you dig into it it's pretty cool there's a lot of famous people i mean obviously included thomas jefferson um as well as somebody named Commodore Stockton, who was a big naval person at the time, had mines and a bunch of interests. Um, but there was uh, a lot of interest going on at that time. It kicked off the first gold rush. That's why there's also a mint in Charlotte, is because Charlotte's literally built on gold mines. Um but that is the, the first gold rush that happened in the U.S. pretty much kicked off here in the southeast. Uh, the general geographic area that we're looking at here is what is called the Piedmont. And it's basically the southeastern Piedmont. I think there might be another Piedmont up in the northeast. And a Piedmont isn't... It's a general term for an area, though it does get used honestly specifically with the Southeast Piedmont, but there are Piedmonts elsewhere in the world. Um, but we're talking about this green area here that you can see that basically runs from almost Maryland all the way down through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. And this is the main area we're focusing on with these the formation of the gold deposits in the Southeast here. Um, there are other smaller gold belts in many of these states, but a good many of them are not within the Piedmont and therefore I, I haven't researched them yet. We'll get into those, but they're not going to be included in this, uh, in this topic here. Uh, but basically 
the area of the Piedmont is a very complex geology and it is difficult to study just due to the it's not due to the terrain necessarily it's due to all the vegetation and the thick decomposed rock mantle that's above everything i mean if, if you've been in this area you know walking around like you actually rarely see rock outcroppings which is how geologists mainly map this type of stuff is by rock outcroppings so while it has had a lot of studies done there's still a lot going on and a lot of new information always coming out just because there's so little rock outcrop available to study um and the piedmont's basically bordered by the the Blue Ridge to the west and the coastal plain to the east. And this geology would also technically, it, it extends under the coastal plain, but it gets way too deep to do anything if there was anything down there. And I believe the, the Brewer and the Hail mines, which are, I think the Hail is current, it is currently working in South Carolina. They're like right on the edge of the uh, coastal plain sediments. And I even think they have to go through coastal plain sediments to get to some of their um, ore bodies and stuff. So there is the potential for there being actual good deposits out under the coastal plain. The problem is they're just not reachable. They're under hundreds of foot of sediment. Um, and yeah, the, the Piedmont area itself, it's generally a Piedmont's that defined as like a gently rolling terrain with broad flat ridge tops and comparatively narrow valleys uh so this is going to be our area of focus here is the green from alabama up to about maryland uh the gold bearing piedmont area really terminates right there around maryland uh and doesn't really extend up further the stuff up there's a little bit in Pennsylvania, but it's not it's not of the same not of the same origin. Um so we will move on here. Wait a second. So now we're gonna start with the general origin of the deposits of the southeastern United States. And the interesting thing about this is is that from what we can tell, they did not form on the North American continent uh, from uh, fossil evidence and other stuff that's caught up in some of the various geologic terrains in the Piedmont. Those fossils that are found are not na were not native to the North American continent at the time and were generally, it seems like they match up with fossils that were found on the African continent at the time of formation of these. Um, and generally, it's thought that these form somewhere between like 541 to 458 million years ago, which is honest, actually like millions of years before the dinosaurs even existed. Uh, and basically, they form probably in close relationship to the African continent, um, and that's where I kind of disagree if you're looking at this diagram here. I kind of disagree with it based off other papers I've read. I kind of actually flipped this, I think. Uh, where, like, this would be Africa, where it says North America should be Africa and Africa should be North America. Because it seems like it formed as a back arc basin off the continent of Africa. But this is all, even, even among the geologic professionals who study this stuff and map it out like it's still not 100% known on the exact relationship of what's subducted under what. But basically we had a volcanic arc um, possibly above water, possibly not, but kind of think like uh, Japan. Japan is an island arc, a volcanic island arc. So we had like a island arc like Japan kind of off the coast of Africa with what is called a back arc basin here, where it's a shallow, more or less kind of inland sea, kind of like the Sea of Japan. And there would have been volcanic activity, both from the island arc, kind of going out into this back arc basin. And uh, as, as the waters 
percolated down into the crust to the hot where magma was and stuff, they would leach out gold as well as other minerals. And then as they would get vented back up to the surface, these enriched waters, or they call them brines, would be heavier than the ocean, ocean water and would sit in the depressions of the seafloor within this back arc basin. And that's where the gold deposits mainly came from, is they were kind of stratiform, in, interlayered, intermixed with various uh, volcanic flows, as well as uh, sedimentary detritus or sedimentary stuff eroding off of both Africa as well as the volcanic arc. Um, so you had those brines, and then the fluids got the 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 gold is, is probably a sulfide mixture of gold. It probably was not pure gold at the time. It was probably microscopic stuff got um, pulled out of the water due to pH changes and then settled into those sediments down on the ocean bottom over on the continent of Africa or right next to it. And then from there, we basically progressed forward to getting them to North America. But this is a general overview of like, you have the convection of hydrothermal fluids bringing up, bringing up this solution that's a gold enriched and then depositing it on the ocean bottom and forming these, uh, what they call stratiform, stratiform gold deposits that are then intermixed with uh, volcanics and sedimentaries. And some of that stuff is going to come back into searching when you're looking for these nowadays, what you need to be looking for. Um, but basically, so the whole evolution of this whole, how did it come from Africa all the way to there is, so we had basically a island arc, I believe, off the coast of Africa. And then, just depending on the geometries of subduction zones and stuff, the island arc eventually is either it was moving towards North America or North America was moving towards it at the time. And eventually it got accreted to North America, probably once again, somewhere in the end of this time frame, maybe near 44, 444 million years ago. Um, and that is when what was called the Taconic mountain range formed. And it basically is was formed due to this island arc, something like Japan, getting accreted up onto and pushed onto the North American continent. Um, and that's how those these submarine exhalative deposits got here, but it's not how we currently see them today either. Um and this basically happened more or less along the entire east coast margin of the what they called Laurentia at the time, which is North America, more or less. Uh, so basically, at this point, we have these submarine exhalative deposits are now mashed up onto the North American continent, but they're still more or less just microscopic gold mixed in with... Uh, so there's still microscopic gold, just basically still bonded with sulfides pretty much exclusively. There'd be very little free gold in any of this at the time. Um, so next what we have happen is the Acadian Caledonian mountain range orogeny event somewhere around 444 million years ago to 323 million years ago. And that is seems to be the main mountain building event that then metamorphosed all of these gold bearing sediments uh, to a high degree. And it was most likely this one that also that predominantly led to that re the remobilization of this gold. So basically what that means is that under the heat and pressure during this next mountain building event, that gold in these stratiform, submarine exhalative deposits got back into fluids and then was generally uh, moved and concentrated into nearby uh, 
quartz vein type systems that are structurally controlled by like shear zones, fold hinges, and cleavages within the rock. So they're all still fairly close to their original source. Um, but now they've moved into structurally controlled zones where you actually have like quartz veins with gold in them and everything. And that's more or less how we see these deposits nowadays. Though they were at least deformed four times. Uh, probably the Acadian Caledonian Mountains or probably other numerous ones that were in there that might have been smaller. Um, that helped remobilize these and there's the potential that each time we had one of these mountain building events slam into the east coast of the u.s that more more mobilization of these fluids happened and more concentration happened uh yeah so basically we're up to three hundred twenty-three thousand years we still don't have the true formation of what everybody knows as the uh pangea or anything at this point this is still just another small kind of island arc kind of more or less associated with what they call Baltica, which is Europe coming in and more so affecting the Canadian side of the East Coast up north. Um, but now we're moving on to basically, now we have at 323 to 252 million years ago is when Africa came over and slammed into the uh, East Coast of the U.S. and formed Pangea. Uh, and then it was at this point, we had a mountain building event. The Appalachians were taller than the Himalayas. Uh, and then everything starts to erode. And I don't know, it could have eroded back to the base at this point. It's hard to say. But basically, we're in this for a while until we have basically the breakup of Pangea at 252 million years ago. And then from from at that point on to pretty much present, the entire east coast of the U.S. has been uh, no tectonic activity or very limited. We have no more mountain buildings events. Everything is now forming the Atlantic as we see nowadays and the east coast as we see nowadays. And what this led to is the formation of a penne plane which is kind of what you see in this uh, diagram here. Is you have this big mountains, big mountains and everything, and then erosion and erosion happens, and eventually their erosion has completely removed mountains the size of the Himalayas, which is just crazy to think about. Um, but then it forms this just giant, flat, broad plain, nearly at sea level, uh, that has, yeah, just decomposed and everything. And a lot of this leads to our next thing here where we have what's called, uh, the, they're basically super gene enrichment of these submarine exhalative deposits. Um, so through the weathering and mechanical and chemical erosion that happened basically almost since the, the breakup of Pangea millions of years ago to today, we've had the East Coast eroding. Um, and a much of it due to the penny plane, much of it that used to be above that penny plane surface that we now have that is the current Piedmont is gone. It's off under the coastal plain sediments, buried way out there and pretty much buried forever. Uh, but the more recent stuff that we have has been what's called super gene enrichment of the gold vein. So basically... What we have happened probably is we had a paleo surface that was how many feet higher above the penny plane at one point that's now not there. And with that, there was a higher water table. Um, and this led to, as the meteoric waters moved down and stuff, they leached the top vein. They leached the top parts of the veins and moved most of that gold, the, 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 uh, gold and everything and enrich it kind of right down and around the water table. And then as, as more erosion and everything happened, we get to the present surface, the water table is now lower. So now you have this super enriched, uh, super gene enriched gold vein above the water table. And this is mainly what they mined back in the day. 
was this enriched part of the gold vein that also had mechanical enrichment happen as well, where just the vein was no longer, it got eroded away and the gold's so heavy it doesn't move, it's just sitting on top of the almost the ground surface or right under it. Um, and it was, it was this was the richest plaster material they actually got was right on top of the vein. And then as they went down, they would hit like the super gene enriched part was able to make it pay, but once they got below the current water table, went predominantly back into sulfides, and they were no longer able to make it pay anymore. And they couldn't deal with the water at the time either, nor the sulfides. Um, so this is basically yeah, the weathering and super gene enrichment that led us to the current setup that we have today with these deposits. Um, from there, let's talk about... Uh, so the, the primary, let's talk about the primary, uh, what are called geologic terrains. So the primary geologic gold-bearing terrains kind of on the east coast here. Uh, and I will, so in up, we'll start north and go south. So in Virginia, the primary one that's called like the gold pyrite belt is particularly the Chapawamzik formation. And in this, we're going to, we're going to blow up and, show the uh whole google earth thing here in a bit but the chapel womzik is more or less this darker purple right here and then we have the northern part of the Heiko arc which is in virginia which is kind of this red area right here which is part of the carolina zone terrains that extends up into virginia they're not quite as gold bearing in virginia for some reason they're more copper but we do have the Heiko arc extending up into Virginia. And then another interesting one that has piqued my interest, and I don't know when I'll get down to look at it, but is the, so you have the Eastern Slate Belt in North Carolina. It does have some gold mines in it. And it extends into Virginia, yet the Virginia side has no documented gold deposits, prospects, or anything. Uh, and it's this kind of light purple area you see here. So I kind of have that in question marks. Is the northern part of the eastern slate belt in Virginia might have some uh, potential for undiscovered deposits? It seems to. We'll talk about that more when we get to the uh, exploring for these deposits. But then you get down to the north and south Carolina and you have what's kind of called the Carolina zone terrains, which has also been called the Carolina Slate Belt. It's gone through a number of name iterations and changes and everything. But the Carolina zone terrains are basically compromised of the Heiko Arc, the Albemarle Arc, and the Kings Mountain sequence, as well as then there's two separate ones with the Eastern Slate Belt and the Charlotte terrain. Um, and these compromise this whole big blob of stuff all through here. And it's part of the reason why North and South Carolina have such huge amounts a lot of times compared to the other East coast States is because there's a lot of primary gold bearing terrains within them. Um, and then when we get down to Georgia, we have this light pink over here. That's called the new Georgia super group. And that pretty much covers the main group of gold bearing terrains from Georgia all the way down into Alabama where in Alabama it dives out under the uh, coastal plain sediments again so there's probably once again gold bearing areas that are undiscovered out under the coastal plain sediments but they're probably just not reachable um, and then we also have the southern part of the Carolina zone terrains extending into Georgia but let's uh, let's take a look at all this on Google Earth, where we can interact with it a little more. Um, so here is our terrain map, the gold bearing terrains that you were just seeing. And if I was prospecting, like going out and looking for new deposits, I would still mainly be focusing on the geologies within these particular terrains because they are going to have the highest likelihood of probably having undiscovered gold deposits. Um, and just to kind of show how everything matches up, we'll also turn on the uh, gold mine locations within these states here. Do, do, do. And you can kind of see 
Uh, it correlates pretty well. So up in Virginia, you have the main gold pyrite belt running up through here, which is the Chapawamzik Formation. And then down in southern, southeastern, south central Virginia, you have what they call the Heiko Arc and the Virgilina terrains and stuff, which are this red part. And you can see there's a good bit happening right in through here that had gold as well as primarily copper. And it extends down into the central south or central North Carolina. Um, and then the, the part that has me interested somewhat is over here in this light purple, which is the eastern slate belt, which is where you have the Portis mine and a number of other that were decently large mines at the time that produced, I think the Portis produced over 150,000 ounces of gold and seems to be, based off its geology, a submarine exhalative deposit, or at least related to. Um, so you have gold deposits down here in North Carolina in the eastern slate belt, and that slate belt extends up to almost Richmond, but we have no gold prospects or reported history of gold throughout this region. Um, and or we're going to talk about that more when we go into the exploration side. <clears throat> but yeah, here's all your gold-bearing terrains, and you see the, how they correspond pretty well with where the predominant number of mines are. Uh, this, uh, this other part out here in North Carolina is its own thing. It's not in the Piedmont. It gets into the Blue Ridge, so it's its own separate, probably also related to the Floyd-type district up here in uh, Virginia, but those are outside the topic of this. And you can see how it even covers the majority of the deposits within Georgia and Alabama as well. Um, and I will, I will make these uh, this primary gold-bearing terrain map layers available, uh, hopefully down in the description here. So you can see all those guys all through there. And it's also what's interesting is you can see the Piedmont itself without even needing a map of the Piedmont. Let me turn some of these layers off. So this dark green is basically the Blue Ridge or the Appalachians currently. And then you see a like it gets lighter out here. This is the coastal plain sediments coming up through here. You can literally see almost a line running through here. And what is in between is basically the Piedmont. Um, and it's interesting, like right in this area, you see kind of the, the Appalachians jut out a bit. And that New Georgia group just stops going forward. So there's a big change in geology right there and why it doesn't continue up into North Carolina nearly as much. Because, I mean, you can look at the, and it just kind of peters out. Um, but it's kind of cool that you can just see you can see the Piedmont region overall on Google Earth without actually even a map of it. It just shows up. Okay, let's go back to our slides here. So where are we at? Okay, so probably what a lot of people have been looking forward to is what are the implications for exploration with trying to find potentially new deposits? Like what ground should you be looking for? What are the geologies that you should be looking for? that have hosted the uh, the most of the uh, historic gold mines within the East Coast here, including what is the London, the London and Virginia mine in Virginia, a bunch of other ones in Virginia, the Hale and Brewer mines in South Carolina, the Portis, and a good number of other mines in North Carolina, South Carolina, as well as almost the whole Dahlonega area is all submarine exhalative deposits. Um, so what are the implications for exploration? We're going to start with, so in, in, in mineral exploration, there's things called brownfield explorations and greenfield explorations. And brownfield explorations are when you are in and around previous previous strikes so previous gold mines and that's what we're going to start with here because as the saying goes if you want to find gold go where gold's been found um so you want to start with your research in and around the historic gold mines and what you're predominantly looking for in this research is those historic gold mines what type of 
structures were they controlled by? So was this big arc of gold mines, was it on a particular uh, fault? So is it is it a fault type system that's on a shear zone or is it on limbs or fold hinges or limbs of anticlines? Or is it within the cleavage of the rock? So you want to find that out because that then helps you point to when you just kind of start like going around some of these old mines then and looking kind of outside where they were, if there's the fault continues and there's no more mines or there's another fault nearby, those are what you want to focus on and try your explorations and pannings where streams cross those other, uh, if it's a fault shear zone system that the mines were related on, you're going to want to explore the nearby shear zones and faults around that because that seems to be what was the, the structure, the structural control on the gold in that area. Um, and same thing goes for if it's a anaclinal system or something or a fold system and it's on the limbs of the folds, then you're going to, if there's other limbs of other folds nearby and they're not all faulted away, then you're going to want to go around that and look at those areas. Um, and that is generally for the brownfield exploration, what you're going to want to do is around your existing mines that you know where they are, look for the what they were structurally controlled by and then expand your search area around those mines and look for similar type of structures that could control them. So you're going to have to find good detailed geologic maps and many exist out there. Um, you just need to know what to look for. And a lot of times it's... Uh, you're looking for seven and a half minute topographic quadrangles. Um, so if you know the name of the topographic quadrangle, which is what your normal topo maps are also going to be named, then you go like geology of uh, the Aurora seven and a half minute quadrangle. And if, if a geologic map exists for that nice and zoomed in, then you should find it. But not all topographic quadrangles have highly detailed geologic maps. Um, and in some cases, for some of this, the highly detailed ones sometimes don't help as much. And that's kind of with... So now let's talk about... Uh, let's go into the greenfield explorations. And here's an interesting statistic for you guys. So I know, like, prospecting is hard. And... A lot of, we, we say go to where gold's been found before because even the big mineral exploration companies who do it all over the world, their success rate in greenfield explorations where there's been no, where the geology may be favorable, but there's no history of mines, their success rate is from a half a percent to one percent. They So they invest tons of money into finding new and unexplored areas and deposits and stuff, and they have a success rate of less than 1%. <laughs> so for the small-scale prospect to go out and do the same thing, there's a reason why. Like, I, when, when I go out and prospect these new areas, the vast majority, yeah, I might find a little gold, but it's nowhere near what I'm looking for. And it kind of goes into those same lines where it's a very small percentage of the time in 100% new areas where gold hasn't been documented, you're going to have like a 1% chance. Um, Brownfield exploration with the big companies has a jumps up to 5% chance of success of finding new deposits. So it just goes to show you that like discovering new gold deposits, whether in greenfield or in brownfield areas, you have a 90 over a 95% chance of failure. Uh, which is crazy, especially with then how you need how these companies need to invest money to do it. But I digress on that point. It's just some interesting percentages on even how the professionals fail ninety five to ninety nine percent of the time when exploring for undiscovered gold deposits. Okay, but greenfield explorations within the southeast here for the submarine exhalative deposits. Um, we're going to go, we're going to kind of go back to here where I was saying these deposits formed 
within these back arc basins that had both volcanic rocks coming in as well as sedimentary. So, and you have uh, volcanic complexes nearby. So what that kind of translates to for us going out and exploring new areas is you're going to want to focus your efforts on areas that are underlain by in, in simple terms, what they call metavolcanic and metasedimentary rocks kind of interlayered, or you can see them next to each other in the geologic maps. And then, so you can have those, but then you also want nearby granite plutons and felsic igneous rocks in somewhat close relationship. And those are going to be your primary search areas. Um for these and then once you're in an area like that you're going to want to then also focus on any particular faults cutting through or nearby the limbs of folds and uh those are going to be your you're going to want to look for those structural controls that they were possibly uh concentrated into um so let's go back to this map here <clears throat> and we're kind of going to zoom in on this um and I'll just kind of show you an example. So we have a bunch of mines up here in in uh, Virginia. Where's my Virginia stuff? Up around uh, Fredericksburg area. And we're going to turn on our geologic map overlay. And as we zoom in and look at this, so we get all the nice pretty colors, all the old mines and stuff. And the Chompawamsic, for Chompawamsic Formation, which is the, the primary gold-bearing formation in Virginia. And if you look, it says interlayered felsic and mafic volcanic rocks. And if you dig into the description, and this is where you're going to have to dig into some of these, because sometimes they'll call them things that like a uh, phylonite, okay? Well, what is that? You need to dig into the description to then learn like what it's... Uh, how it was deposited and by what but basically it says metamorphosed felsic and igne igneous metamorph bleh, mafic volcanic flows volcanic plastic rocks interlayered with quartzites quartzos gray wackies and those are going to be your sedimentary so literally the chopawamsic formation is an entire geologic formation that is interlayered metavolcanic and metasedimentary rocks and then if you look at the other stuff, there's plutons right nearby. There's granite plutons right there. Uh, the Falls Run Nice is probably a metamorphosed pluton. And that's why the Chopawamsic's the primary gold-bearing terrain in Virginia, is it literally has all the showcase stuff footprint for those submarine exhalative deposits. Metasedimentary, metavolcanic, all interlayered with granite plutons in rather close proximity and that's why there's gold mines all through it so now let's go let me turn back off this layer so now let's go down to this northern part of the eastern slate belt in virginia here um which i kind of think it seems like it might have potential so it's something that should be looked into because we have, where are we at? So there's some myelinite, cataclastic rocks. So here's a phylonite. Now the name in and of itself doesn't help. It's probably, if it's a phyllite, a lot of times the phyllite's going to be derived from sedimentary rocks. But if you dig into it, it does say, yeah, dark gray metasedimentary rocks. Um, and breccia myelinite so there's also shear zone stuff so there's possibly a structural control going on there's your metasedimentary right there and then uh da, 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 da. i know we had some other stuff and then in rather close proximity we have mafic and felsic volcanic rocks which say metavolcanic sequence so we literally have three of the things we're looking for already right here. We have a structural control, shear zone. We have metasedimentary. Now it's not saying it's metasedimentary and metavolcanic interlayered. 
but they are in close proximity. So we have each of these in close proximity. And then off further to, well, to the west and to the east, we have a granite. And to the east, we have a granite. So we have all of the potential things for um, a, a uh, submarine exhaled a gold deposit to have potentially formed. Metasedimentary, metavolcanic. Uh, granite plutons nearby, as well as shear zone structural controls, as well as if we dig into the geology here further, there's also probably anticlinal or fold hinges and fold axes and stuff going all through this area. And that's why this area is interesting to me because it has no record, record of gold being found, yet the signs are potentially there. Um, at least I should say it has no record of gold being found on the Virginia side of the border. On the North Carolina side of the border, it has the Portis mine with 150,000 ounces of gold being found. So, that kind of dives into some of your exploration stuff for this. Uh, I find it fascinating, and it's definitely, this has taught me a bunch on it. Uh, so, that's going to be probably about it for... For part one of this, here's some of the uh, references that I use for various papers and pictures that you saw in there. Uh, but this is going to be basically a part one of the formation of gold deposits in the southeast because obviously submarine exhaled deposits are not the only one. Though I will say... If we're, if we're talking about epithermal deposits, almost any of the epithermal deposits within the southeast I've read about form generally in this type of... They were, they were formed in a back arc basin, volcanic arc style system like this. So there's other stuff going on within these areas that had gold forming, not just in the submarine exhaled deposits. But that's going to be for another... Uh, another time on this part uh so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed this i hope it was informative and i didn't get too nerdy into a bunch of stuff but uh sometimes you got to with this you'll have to potentially research some of the terms i was using um just to get a better idea like fold hinges and axes and stuff like that you might need to look into it's rather it's simple once you look it up. I'm, I just also is very time consuming to potentially go and explain it. And Wikipedia can do it probably quicker and better than I can anyways. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed it. If you like this type of material, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you haven't already, you can check out our uh, Etsy store where we have Virginia Gold Pay Dirt as well as 3D printed uh, gold pans and other tools and stuff and more stuff coming. Um, yeah, thanks for watching guys. We'll see you.